coming up and just tell me if it's coming up. Okay. So, good morning. Yep. Um, is it there? Yep. Okay. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> I hope that you can um, hear me and that we're coming through this morning.
Yes, yes. 
Hosanna, Jesus, we do cry Hosanna, Lord, at this time uh, in the world where there's great trouble and sickness. Um, we cry Hosanna, Lord, save us from uh, the coronavirus and uh, save us from times of trial. It's a very uh, appropriate message for, for this time uh, of year. Well, we're going to begin um, our service uh, proper, as it were, and I'm going to put on my church hall. It's very hot work singing uh, Hosanna uh, like that with a guitar. And it's quite humid in here, isn't it? Um, so, I'd like to thank uh, Mandy for being here this morning to turn the pages for me. And um, poor Mandy came in and I, I crumbled at her because I was stressed at the beginning, so I'm sorry, Mandy. Um, now we've started. Well, welcome everybody. The Lord be with you. Um, on Palm Sunday today, we commemorate the triumphant entry of our Lord Jesus into Jerusalem with the readings of today and especially the solemn reading of the suffering of Christ. Our focus moves to the events of Good Friday. The service captures this paradox of welcome and rejection. So we begin this morning the great week of the Christian year. We come together with the church throughout the world to call to mind and to express in word and in action our Lord's Passover from death to life, which is the center of the Easter mystery. Today, Christ enters in triumph into the holy city. And normally, uh, when we have this service, we will enter in singing our praises from the outside, as it were, of the sanctuary. We come in waving our palms and singing Hosanna. So we come into Jerusalem with him to complete his work as our Messiah, to suffer, to die, and to rise again to life. We affirm our desire to follow him with a lively faith, so that sharing his suffering, we may be united with him in his risen life. Now, if you have a palm at home, or a palm cross, or a paper cross that you've made, uh, now is the time to, to hold up your, your cross, and we're going to bless the palms and the crosses uh, to be for us uh, symbols um, of Jesus' triumphant entry and of our welcoming him as our Messiah King. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you would bless these palm crosses being held out around Macau and the world and these palm branches. May they be for us signs of the victory of your Son. May we who carry them in his name Always welcome him as our king, and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. For he lives and reigns in glory, with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I'm going to lay mine up on the altar here, on the table, to remind us uh, during the service. Let us pray together the theme prayer or the collect for Palm Sunday as we say together, Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, so you may join in the responses to the greeting. These are the Palm Sunday greetings. And we speak to the gates of Jerusalem. And we tell the gates to open up and to welcome the King as he arrives on Palm Sunday. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors that the King of the glory, glory may come. come. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, the Lord of hosts, hosts. He is he the, is the King, King of glory. glory. Let us praise Jesus our Messiah, as did the crowds who welcomed him to Jerusalem. Now I'm going to ask Mandy to do a job for me. It's really humid in here. Um, could you ask our phone to turn on that aircon as well? And can you ask her to make it 19 degrees on both sides, if she can, but without talking? <laughs> So as Mandy is going to do an errand, um, we're going to sing without her words. Uh, All glory, Lord, and honor. 
Now this is a traditional Palm Sunday hymn, and it's really intended for the organ. So it's quite hard to play on the guitar because there's a million chords. But we'll give it a go. Shame. 
He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be and this is, of course, a messianic, a prophetic passage speaking of the Messiah uh, facing persecution. We turn now to Psalm 118, uh, beginning at verse 1 to 2, and then verse 19 and following. Um, Andy, do you want to do you want to say the alternate verses? With sure. Me? Okay. So um, I'll say the odd verses, and the women say the even verses. Men odd verses, women even verses. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good; His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim. His mercy endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And on this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, Lord. Hosanna. Lord, send us now success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has shined upon us. Form a procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was, was in the, the beginning, beginning, is now, now and, and will be, be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. And this uh, psalm, of course, was in the minds of the children of Israel as they welcomed Jesus uh, as their Messiah. And they took branches to form a procession as he made his way uh, to the temple, to the horns of the altar. Well, now the women are going to say the, um, the next reading. The epistle reading, chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Uh, so all the ladies at home may read aloud. Let the same. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, be to God. God. We're going to sing our gradual hymn, which is right on, right on in majesty. Once again, this is a hymn which should really be done on the organ, but um, we'll give it a go on the guitar. Right on, right on in majesty. Right on. 
called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. The Lord's Supper. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go out into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. He took, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered him, This very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Then Jesus went out with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. Now while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, 
The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion? You have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Now those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they could not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He is worthy of death. Then they spat in his face and struck him with their fists. And others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. Now when Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, saw that he was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty silver coins to the chief priests and the elders I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So, Jesus, so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went out and hanged himself. Then the chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, for they are blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. 
That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Jesus before Pilate. Now meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Jesus asked them, Which one do you want me to release? Pilate, sorry, when they had, had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. <coughs> Now when Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, Do not have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. And they answered, Crucify him! Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. And then Pilate released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. And they put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him and they took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. And as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And above his head they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Say to yourself, Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the crowd, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He believed in him. He trusted God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. 
In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And they exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. And many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. And going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And the next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take the guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, it's um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it's always very moving to read the Passion or to hear the reading of the Passion of Christ. And um, I guess we we don't read enough. We're so um, familiar now with videos and movies and. The reading has its own magic, I think, as we have to imagine it in our mind, in our, in our imagination. Well, today I'm going to continue with the Three Things series, which I began two weeks ago. And you'll remember that I spoke to you about three things to rule our lives, faith, wisdom, and love. And then I spoke about three lessons from history that we should be willing to lay down our lives for others, that we should not do anything to harm others, so stay home, and that we should meet together, even in an online community, following the spirit of the scripture that says do not neglect to meet together. So this afternoon we will be having a first church-wide Zoom meeting at 3 p.m. Uh, Matthew Potker is moderating the meeting. 
uh, and I've sent out the, the link for that. If you, if you don't have the number, you can contact me or Matt uh, after the service this morning, and we can send you the, the, the account number so you can join us uh, in the Zoom meeting. Uh, we had a, a little Zoom meeting for a few men on Friday night, and it was a lot of fun uh, to get together and see each other. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing who turns up, and I hope we have a good crowd this afternoon at 3 p.m. Might be a bit chaotic, but hopefully it will be it will be fun. Well, this morning um, <clears throat> I want to uh, talk to you. I want to leave COVID here. Maybe you'll be relieved to know I, I don't want to talk today about life under COVID. I want to talk today about Palm Sunday. Um, although <clears throat> it's not entirely irrelevant. Um, sorry, I've got some <clears throat> phlegm in the back of my throat. It's not entirely irrelevant because the topic of my message today is three, <coughs> three, <coughs> sorry, three important things that you can learn. You'll pardon my language, sitting on your ass. Three important things that you can learn sitting on your ass. Now I'm using this term ass in its technically correct term, uh, meaning a donkey. The word ass uh, comes from. Uh, it is the word for. Uh, Equus Africanus, the African horse, otherwise known as an ass. Uh, the, a young male ass is called a jackass. Uh, it's also called, uh, a male ass is called a jackass, a young male ass is called a colt. Jesus rode a colt, so he was riding on the back of this young jackass. And I think that's kind of appropriate because sometimes I'm a bit of a jackass. And I think I carry, I was a jackass this morning when poor Mandy arrived. I was very stressed out, trying to get everything ready. And um, she, uh, she was lost and I said, I can't find you. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. So I was a jackass. And I think sometimes when we carry Jesus, uh, we also are jackasses. Jackass means a silly person. Because uh, asses are not famous for being smart. They're actually quite dangerous. I heard this week that more people die in the world every year from donkeys. More people are killed by donkeys than die in plane crashes. It's more dangerous to ride a donkey than to ride in a plane. So donkeys are famous for being bad-tempered and stupid and having a very strong will, temperament. So three things you can learn sitting on your ass. Now uh, many of us have been doing a lot of sitting on our ass, the other kind of ass. And so maybe we can learn something today sitting on our <clears throat> other ass about what it's like or what we can learn from the scripture about Jesus' donkey ride. So first of all, um, I'm going to borrow my Bible back from uh, Mandy. And um, thank you. Because I need this Bible to prop up my notes. Going on blind. And I want you to turn to John's Gospel. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And chapter 12. Now... This is John's account. We, we Earlier we read Matthew's account, but this is John's account, and it's fairly brief. And um, it's found in um, John chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. And he doesn't go into as much detail as Matthew does, but there are some things in here that I'd like us to see this morning. First of all, I want to point out that we're beginning this week, the final week of Jesus' life. And when you look at the Gospels, you find that 50%, half of John's Gospel, deals with the events of Holy Week. That should tell us something. A Gospel is not a biography. A Gospel is a Gospel. It's a unique kind of literature. Biography is a different kind of literature. A biography tells you the life story of a person. But in, in the four Gospels, most of the focus is on one week. Uh, actually, it's on three years, but it's on one week within those three years of Jesus' ministry. There's very little time given to the beginning of his life and the first 30 years of his life. So 50% of John's Gospel deals with Holy Week. 40% of Matthew's Gospel deals with Holy Week. 60%, 60% of Mark's Gospel, the shortest of the Gospel, deals with with Holy Week. And in Luke, it's one third. So Luke gives us more about the rest of Jesus' life. As you know, Luke has the great Christmas stories of the angels and the shepherds and all that. So we get a lot more information from Luke about other parts of Jesus' life. 
We think that Luke probably got it from Mary. Anyway. So, Holy Week. There are 89 chapters in the four Gospels altogether. Uh, and of those, only four chapters cover the first 30 years of his life. 85 chapters of them, of 89, cover the, la- the next three and a half years, the last three and a half years. And of those 89, 85, 29 cover the last week. So 29 of 89, uh, you could say one third covers the last week. So when you, when you add it all up, all four Gospels, one third covers the last week. So this should tell you something. This week is very important for us as Christians. I also add as an aside that this is one very lucky jackass. That this donkey uh, gets to be the donkey that carries the Savior of the world, the King, the King of Israel, the Messiah, uh, into Jerusalem on his triumph day. So this is a very lucky little donkey, young male donkey. Now this is called Palm Sunday and we're celebrating the triumphant entry of Jesus. In the Jewish calendar, Palm Sunday came several days before the Passover. And we know, therefore, that it was in the Jewish calendar, the lunar calendar, it was the 10th day of what they called the month of Nisan. Now, the 10th day of the month of Nisan was important for Jewish families because on that day, they would go to the market and select a perfect lamb for sacrifice for the Passover meal a few days later. So this was the day on which the lamb would be chosen who would be the Lamb of God, the Lamb of Deliverance. Interesting, isn't it? And, and um, interestingly, we see Jesus, the Lamb of God. John the Baptist saw Jesus. The first thing he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. So here we have Jesus, the Lamb of God, being hailed and chosen by the people. Hosanna to the King. Hosanna to the Son of David. That means He's their King. They're choosing Him as their King. And he was, you remember, he was crucified under the charge of being the king. So here he is riding into Jerusalem on the, the, the tenth day of Nisan when they're choosing the lambs for sacrifice, for their deliverance, and they're claiming him as the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Son of David, the King of Kings, coming to them. Now in our, in our calendar, in our Julian calendar, some scholars have calculated that this fell on April the 6th in 32 AD. I thought that's kind of neat because today is April the 5th, so it's almost the same date uh, here in in 2020, except the first date uh, people estimate was perhaps in 32 AD. There are different theories about this, of course. So I want to share with you three things that we can learn sitting on a donkey. The first thing that I see in this story that I want to share with you this morning is that Jesus is extremely appealing to people. And the the religious leaders were not happy. They wanted to appeal to people. We clergy, we pastors, we want people to follow us. But actually, uh, it's not us that's appealing to people. It's Jesus that's appealing to people. And we see this in John chapter 12 and verse 12. And we read, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way. So they took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting Hosanna, which means save us now. Uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. John chapter 12 verses 12 and 13. So Jesus was attractive to them. They were excited to meet Jesus. And I think today... Jesus is still attractive to people. Even people that are not Christian, that are seekers after spirituality, everybody likes Jesus. Everyone is interested in Jesus. And they find Him attractive, even today. He is the most significant person, after all, in human history. More has been written about Him, more people follow Him than anyone else. If you're cold, we can turn it off now. I think it's it's not actually solving the humidity, it's just making it cold. So, should we turn one off? No? You're okay? So, um, so this is the Passover, uh, attendance is required, and they're celebrating their deliverance from slavery in Egypt, and Jesus shows up, and they're looking for a deliverer from the Romans. And, I mean, they've been following his progress. They know about the miracles. Only a few days before, he's raised Lazarus from the dead. 
And this has caused a lot of attention, and there are many people in the crowd who were there. Bethany is just a couple of miles outside Jerusalem. There are lots of people at this triumphant entry who saw Lazarus raised from the dead, and there are lots of people that those people told about Lazarus being raised from the dead, first-hand witnesses. So, you know, this is, this is a hot crowd. I mean, these guys are running hot. And, um, and they, you know, they welcoming him. Hosanna, save us now, Lord. You know, they were, they were believing in him as the king, the Messiah. So why is Jesus so appealing? I want to quickly suggest four reasons here within this point one. Jesus is appealing. Number one, he appeals to our heart. He, he's not pretty on the outside. He's not, you know, vestments and buildings and, and appearances. Um, he's not superficial. Jesus goes to the heart. He touches how he's real. And today people are looking for faith which is real. They're not looking for religion that's superficial. We want, we want genuineness. We want, we want reality in, in our spiritual life. So number one, he, he emphasizes the inner reality, the heart. He's always talking about the heart. God looks on the heart. Secondly, Jesus is not all about what we cannot do. Sure, the law is there, and he upholds the moral law and the spiritual law. But his focus is not on what we should not do. His focus is on what he can do through you. His focus is on what he can achieve through, through my miserable, sinful, broken life. In spite of the fact that I don't do what I should do, he can do great things through me uh, for good in the world. That's the second reason he's appealing. Because he can transform my miserable, sinful life into something meaningful for His glory. The third reason why Jesus is appealing is that He doesn't put up barriers between people. He breaks down barriers. Make way, make way for Christ the King in splendor arise. He is breaking down the barriers. He is raising up the, the way to God. And he, he, there were many barriers. You know, you couldn't go to God if you were in Israel in those days. If you were a Gentile, you were in the outside Gentile courts. If you were a eunuch, you were even further out. If you were a woman, you were out. And then if you were a man, you could get a bit further in. If you were a priest, you could go right near in. And if you were a high priest, one day a year, the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Well, you know what Jesus did? He ripped all the barriers in two. When he died on the cross, the, the curtain of the temple, which was this thick, woven, this thick, was rent in two from top to bottom. He opened the way for us to God. So Jesus emphasizes the heart Jesus is about what He can do through us, through our broken lives, sinful lives. And Jesus breaks down the barriers between God and man and between people and people. And Jesus is the way to God. It's not our works. Every religion in the world is about how can I work my way to God? What can I do to find God? What can I do to be acceptable to the gods? And Jesus wipes all that away. And He says, you don't have to do anything because it's all done. I did it on the cross. He is the way. He says, I am the way. There's not a way. He is the way. So Jesus is so appealing to us for these reasons. So, and they're shouting, save us now, Hosanna. Now, they may not have been able to articulate all of those things, but they understood them. They felt them in their heart. And we read that the Pharisees were in despair. I mean, they were losing this game. They're watching all the crowd welcoming him, Hosanna to the Son of David. And the Pharisees weren't believing it. You know, they thought it was blasphemy that he was not the Messiah. And so in verse 19, the Pharisees say to one another, We're getting nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. I love that. The whole world has gone after him. You know, that was prophetic. Because since then, the whole world has gone after him. More people following Jesus than anyone in human history. So that's the first thing you can learn sitting on your ass. Jesus is attractive. The second thing you can learn sitting on your ass is that Scripture is reliable. It's more reliable than people's opinions. You know, these days with everything that's going on um, with the, the covid and, uh, and the COVID-19, we've all become experts, not me included, you know, we all read things and articles and then, and then we're medical experts and scientists online. And, um, and then the scientists seem confused, you know, the World Health Organization telling everybody don't wear masks. Uh, and actually the research has been done by Hong Kong U, Professor Duggan tells me they did the research a long time ago in Hong Kong U that masks 
prevent the spread of the majority of droplets. In other words, masks work. Now the World Health Organization has turned around and they're telling everybody, well, maybe it's a good idea if you all wear masks. You're a little bit late, fellas. Um, but, but the point is, even the experts are confused. Sometimes you can be so clever that you can miss the donkey in the room. Anyway, that's an aside. I want to talk about the reliability of scripture. Because even our experts can't be counted on. We're unreliable. And certainly our opinions are unreliable, although we all have them. In, in John chapter 12, verse 14, it says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, uh, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion, see, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Did you notice what it said? As it is written. Um, this had been written. This had been prophesied 500 years before. Everyone has an opinion about everything. Everyone had an opinion about Jesus. Some people said he was Moses. Some people said he was Elijah, come back from the dead. Some people thought he was a rebel. Some people thought he was a prophet. Some people said he has a demon. And some people said he is crazy. Even his family at one point thought he was crazy. And they were all wrong. But John quotes the Old Testament. He quotes Psalm 118, 25 and 26. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he quotes Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Fear not, your king is coming to you. And that's exactly what was happening. They were greeting him as the blessed one coming in the name of the Lord. He was, he was God coming to the temple. And secondly, he was coming riding a colt uh, as the king as the king of Israel and the high priest of the temple. And these, this, these things were prophesied hundreds of years before. The Psalm, a thousand years. Zechariah, 500 years before. So the scripture that, so you see, God's revelation is more reliable than our estimation. Now why a donkey? Um, well, as you may know, popularly well known, it says your king will come to you riding on a donkey. In those days, when a king rode a donkey, it meant he was coming in peace. Um, and when a king rode a horse, it meant he was coming in war and judgment. And you know, the book of Revelation tells us that when Christ returns, he's not riding a donkey. When he returns, he's riding a white horse. But when he came the first time to us, he came in peace. So we call him the Prince of Peace. And there's really a, a song that sums up today's whole story, a children's song. You know, the, the little children's song, We Have a King Who Rides a Donkey. We have a king who rides a donkey. We have a king who rides a donkey. We have a king who rides a donkey, and his name is Jesus. Jesus the King is risen. Jesus the King. I think you know the tune. So, Jesus riding a donkey comes as the King, and they acclaim him as the King. Now, in Luke's Gospel, John tells us the event, oh, this event, Palm Sunday, is in all four Gospels, which means it's important. Um, but Luke tells us what Jesus said. John doesn't tell us what Jesus said. But if you go to Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, I'll take you a bit more time today because this is important, you know, this is the center of our faith. Luke 19 uh, verse 41 uh, and it says, Jesus is weeping. It says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had known, only known, on this day, some translations have on your day, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. Uh, other translations say, if only you had known the hour of your visitation, the hour when God was coming to visit you. The day that would bring you peace, peace with God, peace with others. He says, the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment and circle you and hem you in, and they will dash you to the ground and the children within the walls, and they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now that happened in 70 AD. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem and they slaughtered the population and they sowed salt on the Temple Mount so nothing would grow there. They made it into a literal desert, the Romans did. So that prophecy of judgment came true. It's, you know, it's something we don't like to be reminded of, that Jesus is not only our Savior, He is also the judge. He pronounces judgment. So when you face the judgment, see, the one you want to have on your side is the judge. The one you want to be friends with 
is the guy that's passing judgment. And he is the one who came to die for our sin. He is the lover of our soul. But he has to satisfy the law. If he just lets us go, then he's not a good judge. So there has to be judgment. So that's why he took the judgment upon himself. So the judgment fell on him for our salvation. So we, we read here and he says, You did not know the time of God's coming to you. Now, that is a reference. He's referring to Daniel chapter 9. Verses 25 and 26. Um, in Daniel chapter 9, I'm not going to look it up now, it's a, it's a complicated passage, but in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel gives a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. He calls him the Anointed One, which is literally Messiah. And um, he says that, he, he gives a, 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 a number of numbers, numerals, so many times so many, and so many times so many, and it adds to 483. And what the prophecy is saying is that in 483 years from when the king at that time sends the Israelites back to rebuild Jerusalem. Now that happened under Nehemiah. And we know when that happened. Um, it happened about 445, 445 BC. Uh, and, and so the prophecy says that from the time when um, the king Artaxerxes at the time sends the captives, the Jewish captives, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city. From that time, uh, after 483 years, Daniel says, the anointed one will come and will be killed. Now that's really shocking because number one, it's extremely specific prophecy. And number two, it says the Messiah will be killed, which was not, and is not today still, part of general Jewish reckoning of, of what happens to the Messiah. But Daniel actually specifically says that the anointed one will be killed. And he, will, he also says he will establish the new covenant, a new covenant. Now, many scholars have studied this, and one of them is a, a, a head of Scotland Yard, um, a man who is an expert in criminal investigation called Sir Robert Anderson. And Anderson wrote a book about this prophecy called The Coming Prince. And what he found was that when you take this um, 483 years, if you, can, if you count them as lunar years, not as solar years, at the time when Daniel wrote the prophecy, he was living in Babylon. And the Babylonian Jewish calendar was a lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar had 360 days, not 365 days, like the solar calendar. So, uh, Anderson calculated, if you take 483 times 360, it adds up to 173,880 days. Now, if you divide that by 365, by the solar calendar, what date do you arrive at? Well, from the time, from the date when the, when Artaxerxes made his decree, which was on March the 14th, 445 BC, this is what Anderson calculated. From March the 14th, 445 BC, counting 173,880 days, we arrive at April the 6th, 32 AD. In other words, that's the day I spoke about at the beginning, the 10th of Nisan, or the first Palm Sunday. Now, I'm not sure about the scholarship. I'm not a scholar in this, in this matter, and I'm not a historian. But this is what Anderson, who was an expert in evidence and criminal investigation, this is what he researched and what he wrote in his book, The Coming Prince. And um, he found that, in fact, the date when the Messiah should come uh, and be killed fell uh, on Palm Sunday. And it is indeed on Palm Sunday that Jesus is revealed as the Son of David, the Messiah. That's when they publicly and wholeheartedly acclaim him as the Messiah, and that's what he's killed for. He's executed because he said, I am the king. I am the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. He, I, he chose that. He identity. He came riding on a donkey, as the Messiah should, from Zechariah to show that he was the king. So on that day, for the first and only time, he presents himself, and all through his ministry, when he would do a miracle, and, and then uh, you know he would say, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. We call this the messianic secret. But on this day, there's no secret. On this day, he rides in and says, Here I am. You know, lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O everlasting doors. 
that the King of Glory may come in. And he rides in. And they expected that he would go to the fortress Antonio to the right and that he would cast out the Romans. But instead, he goes left to the temple and he casts out the money changers and the robbers in, in the temple who are ripping off the poor. Not what they expected. Now, um, in John chapter 12, going back to John 12, verse 16, um, let me go back there again. John 12, 16, it says, At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they understand that these things had been written about him. So, you know, I'm comforted by that. These things are not immediately easy for us to understand. The disciples didn't, didn't immediately, the penny didn't drop right away. But after he had died and risen again and, and appeared to them, the penny dropped. And like, ah, oh, okay, he's the one, he fulfilled, you know, the prophecies. And they realized that, and that's why Matthew says, and the, and the gospel writers say again and again, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Because, and Jesus says, this is done so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. He's betrayed for 30 pieces of silver in the temple. This is prophesied in the Old Testament, very specifically. Jesus says, this is done, so Scripture may be fulfilled. So what this tells me is that I, I'm more likely to trust Scripture than to trust your opinion or someone's opinion about this. Because these things are, that we're talking about historical documents, we're talking about things that have proven the test of time to people of great intellect down through the ages. So that's the second thing that you can learn sitting on your ass. You remember the first thing? Uh, the first thing was that Jesus is appealing. The second thing is that Scripture can be is reliable and trustworthy. God speaks to us through His Word. And I need to get on and finish this uh, service. The third thing this morning is that it's following Jesus that counts. You can know all these things and you can hear a titillating and interesting sermon about historical details. Uh, but there were four kinds of people there on that day. In verse 16, we read that the disciples were there and they didn't understand. They were like, oh, what's going on? And then in verse 17, we read that there were eyewitnesses of Lazarus' resurrection. There are people who had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. In verse 18, we read there were many other people who had heard that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And number 19, there were Pharisees and religious experts who were there, and they were all like, ah, oh, we're getting nowhere with this, everybody's following him. So there were these four groups of people who were all observing what was going on. The disciples who didn't understand, they observed, but they didn't understand. The eyewitnesses who had seen Jesus raise a man from the dead. People who had heard the eyewitnesses. And then the religious experts who were, who were antagonistic. And the thing about all of these people it was there, is there was only one group of people who did what was necessary, who responded in the right way. So what's the right response to Jesus? Well, the third thing that you can learn sitting on your, your ass, on your donkey, is that the thing that's important is not what you see or what you know or what you observe or learn. The important thing is whether you follow it or not. More to the point, whether you follow Him or not. You see, Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they did not know the hour of their visitation. They did not know the significance of what was going on. And if you look down in John 12 to verse 26, Jesus says, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be. And my Father will honor the one who serves me. So you see, it's all very well to be a Christian and to know these things, or to be a non-Christian and study and read about religion and so on. But they're all meaningless. The thing that counts with God is following and serving. Do we follow Him and do we serve Him in Christ and Christ in others? Do we follow Him and do we serve Him? So, it doesn't matter how much you know. It matters how much you put into practice. It doesn't matter how much you've observed or understood or how converted you are. What matters is whether you follow Him in your life. And so today as I close, I want to ask you this question. Not only are you following and serving Him, but do you recognize the hour of your visitation? 
Because if you catch the ring, but drop the jewel, then you miss the whole thing. It's not enough to catch the ring. We have to catch the diamond in the ring. And the diamond in the ring is following and serving the servant of all. Amen. These are the things that you can learn sitting on your ass. I'm sorry, I'm an Australian. What can I say? Okay, we're going to go on. I know that today's service is a bit long, um, but I think it's been important to share this message today. So you might want to watch today's service in parts. We're going to, uh, if you're at home, you want to stand, it's up to you. We're going to say the creed now, which is on page four in the prayer book. We declare together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he was incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scripture and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Uh, Matthew, I, I put at the back there uh, some prayers so you can follow along. And it's at the litany which it was opened at when you came in. So friends, let us pray. Um, and this morning I would ask your prayers uh, for one of our church members, Jamie, who's in hospital. Uh, Jamie has lupus and she's having treatment. It's an autoimmune condition. So please pray. She's uh, struggled with this for many years. So we're praying for healing for Jamie this morning in hospital as we pray for the world. Not a good time to be in hospital and have an autoimmune condition, you'll understand. So please lift her up uh, in your hearts uh, this week ahead. Let us pray to God who alone makes us dwell in safety, who is our refuge in trouble. The response is, Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the health and well-being of our nations, that all who are fearful and anxious may be at peace and free from worry. We pray for all who are affected by the coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Especially this morning, we pray for the United States and the United Kingdom, which are especially being hammered at this time. But we also pray for all the nations of the world. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. us. We pray for those governors and leaders of nations at this time, those shaping national policies, that they may make wise and generous decisions. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear, hear us. us. We pray for doctors, nurses, medical researchers. Pray for my nephew Matthew at Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, in ICU uh, there, for Rachel Park, for Jennifer, for Lindy, for Yeti in China now, for Ingrid, uh, for all the family members, uh, for all our church members uh, who are doctors and nurses, uh, that through their skill for, for Vincent and Vicky, we, we pray that through their skill and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. us. We pray for the isolated and housebound, that we may be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability, for the vulnerable and fearful, for the gravely ill and those dying alone, the 
that they may know your peace and comfort, Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. Father, we pray for our homes, our spouses, our children, our families, our elders, our schools, for our teachers, for all in any need or distress, for a blessing on our community in Macau and Hong Kong, that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship where all are known and cared for. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. us. So, Father, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful, Merciful Father, Father, accept these prayers yes. for the sake Sick of your of Son, Son, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to break bread, we remember the words of Jesus. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We turn to the confession on page 6. So we confess our sins, saying, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Dear friends, hear these words of absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us uh, that help us. <laughs> peace be with you, Matthew. Peace be with you. Bless you. So friends, uh, once again, the announcement this afternoon at 3 p.m., we will have the um, Zoom meeting for fellowship for the congregation just to say hi. And then um, also on Good Friday at 2 p.m. here, there will be a service at 2 p.m. So you can tune in on Good Friday for readings and, and songs uh, and for renewal of our baptism vows at that time. We will sing our offertory hymn as we offer to God our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we keep our promises to the Most High God. <coughs> We're going to sing um, number 990. I will offer up my life. <coughs>
you turn to page 8, as we say together um, the offering prayer, we pray together, Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For all things in heaven and on earth are yours. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you.
trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Dear friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance by the Spirit now. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Receive in your heart the presence of Christ, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ keep you in eternal love. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal love. Hear the word of the Lord from Philippians chapter 2. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. We join together in the prayer on page 25. As we give thanks for these mysteries, we pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and your family and those whom you love now and forevermore. Amen. We're going to sing our, our closing hymn. I'm going to get my guitar. As we sing our closing hymn today, which is the old rugged cross. Bit out of practice, so my fingers are raw, raw because I have. When you play guitar, you have to build up a, a callus on your fingers, and I haven't played for a long time, so my fingers are not callous. The old rugged cross. On a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame, and I love. Yeah.